We're going to start. So if you guys can mute yourselves, here we go. And action. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Her Story Summit 2020. This is Gertrude Mache here in beautiful Wellington, New Zealand. It gives me great pleasure to be able to connect with you this morning and share with you this amazing journey that we are going to take you on today with inspiring stories from women from all over the world. Now, for those of you who know me, who have come to my live events, you know that we do not start anything without dancing to African music. So I'm going to ask you to all get up wherever you are, try and feel as if you are at a physical event, you're having a physical experience, and we're going to shake our bodies just for a few minutes to get the energy back. You know what African drumming can do. It moves you. It brings you into the room. I know some of you are thinking about what you should be doing after this conference or what you should have done yesterday. I want you to be present. I want you to be here with us, experiencing every single story this morning. So here we go. It will always start with dance, no matter where we are in the world. And we are going to have a phenomenal conference. It just gives me such great pleasure to be able to share this platform with all of you today. So here we go. Just move and shake what your mama gave you. Yes, move your bodies and smile. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! Yes, can you feel that? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for playing. There is something that happens when you listen to African music. When I was a little girl, we used to dance and I try and infuse the dancing into everything I do. And what happens is you go back into your body. Your spirit goes back into the center of everything that is. So I want you to be fully present to every single woman who is in the room today. They have come to gift you with their stories. And you've come to gift us with your presence in the listening. So the Her Story Conference is about creating safe spaces for women's stories to be heard. We're here to hold you. In Africa, we believe that a problem shared is a problem halved. The minute you tell your story to somebody else, it's not yours to carry alone. We are here to carry it with you. So to launch our amazing first online summit, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Paula Tesoriro, I hope I have pronounced your name right. If I butchered it, please correct me and reintroduce yourself. She is the Disability Rights Commissioner for New Zealand, and her role is to protect and promote the rights of disabled New Zealanders. She is the Chief Demission for the New Zealand paraplegic team heading to Tokyo. She's also a paraplegian herself, cycling gold medalist, a former lawyer, a general manager at Statistics New Zealand and at the Ministry of Justice. She is the life trustee of the Holberg Foundation and has held a range of governance roles on various boards. And most importantly, she's a mom. Paula, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for gracing us with your presence this morning. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Gertrude. Kia ora koutou katoa. 
Her Story, Women's Global Empowerment Online Summit Speakers from Around the World. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our circle right here in beautiful Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm really honoured to be part of opening this exciting global event, and I'm looking forward to hearing other people's stories as well. I'm aware that many of you are joining from lockdown around the world, and I want to acknowledge you and say how delighted I am that you can take part in this Her Story Circle. I hope you can participate in many of the talks scheduled from today until the 13th of December. Now more than ever is the time for us to reach out, even virtually across oceans and lands to connect with old and new friends, share our stories, our wisdom, our hearts, and of course, our laughter. A little bit about me first. I was born on the Kapiti Coast here in New Zealand. And much of my own story and journey to this role is centered around a bike. I was born with a number of medical issues relating to my limbs and had multiple surgeries throughout life. And I took that frustration and perhaps quest for independence as a young person out on a bike. And I rode my bike everywhere because it gave me a sense of freedom and a sense of independence and a sense of being equal to others. Because while I couldn't walk fast, I could ride a bike fast, it turned out. And over the years, I got faster at riding a bike. And it took me to some wonderful parts of the globe and ultimately took me to the Beijing Paralympic Games in 2008, where I was able to win gold and two bronze medals. And from there went on to spend the next decade really involved in sport and disability and seeing sport and opening opportunities for disabled young people to participate in sport and to have that sense of identity and equality with others. It wasn't the medals though, that I was most proud of. They, they're nice, they're lovely, they hang on my wall. But actually it was the journey to becoming a Paralympic athlete that was the most incredible and the most rewarding part of my story because I started as a child really wanting to resist any identity as being a disabled person. It just wasn't a word I wanted to use. I didn't want to hang out with disabled people. I wanted to do everything I could to somehow be different from disabled people. And actually to become a Paralympic athlete, well, you have to out yourself as a disabled person. And rather than spending my whole life trying to hide this identity, actually embracing it and understanding how much power and strength I draw from that identity as a disabled person, ultimately made me far more authentic. And it literally, I think, made me faster on the bike because I didn't have all of that stuff weighing me down. And so when I confronted all of these issues and the fears around stigma and really challenged my own assumptions and what it was that was preventing me from being proud of being a disabled person, I learned so much. And it's why I feel very privileged to be in a role where I can now give voice to and in support of the disability community here in New Zealand and wherever I get the chance globally as well. 
So the role I'm in now enables me to help give that voice. And now I think giving voice to disabled people in our world and the situation that we find ourselves in is so important. Worldwide, the response by governments to COVID-19 has emphasized that we are all in this together. And it got me thinking since the start of this year about whether in fact we can stay in this together. Because by staying in this together and staying more connected globally, perhaps we do have a fighting chance of achieving the catch cry of leave no one behind. In rebuilding our world, I've been wondering whether we can indeed achieve a more inclusive society. Will the 15% of the global population, the 1 billion people who are disabled, be front and center or will we, will we be left behind? This Thursday, the 3rd of December, is International Day for Persons with Disabilities. The United Nations theme is building back better towards a disability inclusive, accessible and sustainable post COVID-19 world. For me, it's so, so critical that we give voice to disability rights in this build back. We use the term here in New Zealand, disabled people rather than people with disabilities. And the reason that we do that is to echo the social model of disability, which says, I'm not disabled by the individual impairment I have, but rather I'm disabled by the barriers that society creates, which reduces effective participation in our world. And that echoes the responsibility that we all have globally to do whatever we can to reduce those barriers so that people can participate fully. The UN believes that disability inclusion will result in a COVID-19 response and recovery that better serves everyone. We know that emergency measures have been immensely challenging around the world for disabled people. It became apparent very quickly here in New Zealand that existing gaps in services and policy approaches were exacerbated for disabled people. But New Zealand wasn't alone in this, and I connected more with global friends this year than perhaps ever before, despite the restrictions in travel. As the Disability Rights Commissioner here in New Zealand, I was closely involved in monitoring the impact on disabled people, which make up 24% of our population, and on escalating issues for resolution. The New Zealand government moved at speed to firstly initiate border restrictions, and then some weeks later, introduced a range of more restrictive measures, including a lockdown. Like other countries, this created enormous challenges and enormous challenges for disabled people. Things like access to personal protective equipment was an issue. Not being able to access that put the well-being of some disabled people at risk. Access to the basic necessity of food was an issue. Supermarkets created online shopping spots, but some disabled people reported not being able to access those quickly because everyone else was using them and therefore relying on emergency services. Then there were those who did go to supermarkets only to face the judgment of being out. And for people with neurodisabilities and learning disabilities, they face judgment for not being familiar with these new social norms of queuing and standing a meter apart. <coughs> the digital divide created real challenges for disabled people who simply couldn't access online information. Access to information is critical for participation and this is an area we all need to learn from. There were considerable delays in getting information in accessible formats out to disabled people at a time when information was changing daily, if not by the hour, the frustration was palpable. 
disabled people's organisations here in New Zealand worked incredibly hard to create accessible formats. While there was frustration, there was also a great willingness by the government to work in partnership on a number of these issues and create accessible formats throughout the COVID-19 response, like the use of New Zealand Sign Language in the daily televised briefings. And I hope that that will lead to a much better provision of information in the future. Transport issues were exacerbated. A common issue raised with me was the lack of usual support, such as respite care not being available, creating real stress for families. But perhaps one of the biggest learnings will be seen in the absence of disability data. It's an old truism that if you are not counted, you don't count. Like many other countries, disaggregated disability data is scarce in New Zealand. It's vital that countries collect good information about disability so that we have much more than anecdote to rely on about the impact of COVID on disabled people. Disabled people here in New Zealand watched with sadness, pain, and at times horror at what was happening around the world. Stories of not for resuscitation orders for disabled people were shared, allegations of eugenics at play. These took place around the critical issue of who would and who would not receive life-saving treatment. Our concerns were valid, not because of anything that any New Zealand leader ever said or any medical professional ever did, but simply because we were in unprecedented times. Changes were happening fast and anything was possible. Because our public health response in New Zealand has been excellent, we have not had to confront those rationing decisions here. But when we face a lifetime of very poor attitudes and barriers in which disability can be seen as a life not worth living, it's not surprising that many were scared and felt powerless that the state might end up with the power to judge whose lives do and don't matter. I saw firsthand agencies grapple with how to ensure that marginalized groups were responded to and a number of things were put in place to work with communities and empower communities to respond to the challenges of COVID. But it was very true that disabled people started from behind and it was always likely that we would remain behind during the response and that inequities would be exposed. I'm now focused as many are here on equity and ensuring that we start from the same place in this recovery. This has never been clearer in my mind than the transition to loosening restrictions that were in place and the return to business as usual, which is not so straightforward for everyone. It pained me to hear that many members of the disability community enjoyed lockdown more than being out and about because they didn't have to face this daily grind of the barriers that people ordinarily encounter. Barriers like inaccessible venues and transport, inflexible employment, an education system that's not always welcoming, inaccessible information, a lack of accessible homes, the list goes on. The pandemic has shown us we can work differently Flexible working arrangements and a new reliance on technology all have the potential to enrich the lives of disabled people and be a real circuit breaker. Businesses looking for that edge in a new environment would want to make their services available, surely, because the over 1 billion people in the world who are disabled is a large market share. The pandemic also created a real urgency for government agencies to respond to disabled people. And I'm hopeful that those who might not have had disability at the forefront of their work and thinking will do so now. Disabled people are no stranger to isolation restrictions and exclusions that other people have now experienced through COVID. Suddenly, non-disabled people experienced many of the things we face in our daily lives. If we hold on to this, 
perhaps there's a fighting chance that we will change our attitudes about disability. I believe the pandemic has unified us globally and it certainly has unified the disability community. In the middle of this year, the independent monitoring mechanism, which monitors New Zealand's compliance with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, highlighted where we're at as a country with implementing the convention. And the report highlighted a number of ongoing issues facing disabled New Zealanders. COVID really exacerbated those issues. They didn't create them. In, underly in addressing underlying inequity, we have to ensure that disabled people have a voice. And part of using this platform today is to give that voice globally to issues affecting disabled people. And it won't surprise the awesome bunch of people who are listening to this and a part of sharing your stories. That disabled women fear worse in many instances, be that health, be that the increased incidence of violence and abuse, family and sexual violence. I'll be focused in the coming years on things like housing, violence, employment, education, improving data and evidence, access to health, and initiating a national conversation. And maybe you could help make it a global conversation about attitudes towards disability and disabled people. Because you see, I'm convinced that my own journey to this role and my own journey to understanding my identity as a disabled person was so critically impacted by what I saw as a child and the stigma and the negative attitudes that we had towards disability that meant I wasn't okay. It wasn't okay for me to be my authentic self. I had to try and be like what I saw and thought a non-disabled person was. So what can you do? Wherever you are in the world, ensure disabled people are at the table, that they're included in leadership roles. Because I wonder if my journey to this role would have been less painful if I had seen disabled women doing great things if I had seen them at the table, if I had seen them in parliament, in local government, on boards, if I had seen them expressing their voice, then I wonder if it would have been less painful. It's only when we have disabled people at the table that we will drive the change the world so desperately needs. Whether we can create a more inclusive world, one where the small Paula, who always saw herself on the outside of this inaccessible world, will feel like she could be more included, will depend on our collective advocacy our calls to action to address the many gaps for disabled people that have existed for far too long and that were exposed and continue to be exposed through our response to COVID-19. This really is up to all of us. I hope we can stay in this together, learn from things that could have been done better, amplify the things that were done well and ensure sure that no one is left behind. Using this platform to give disabled people voice and to start conversations about disability is so important because I'd like to thank that disabled young people around the world who are now growing up don't worry about stigma, they don't have fear, they don't feel left out, left behind and actually can be authentic in their life journey from the beginning. 
I would have loved to have had that in my growing up. But instead, all I saw was stigma and fear. And I was always the different one because somehow we just didn't know how to do inclusiveness. And really in the scheme of things, I'm not that old. It wasn't that many decades ago that I was going through our schooling system. It pains me that young disabled people in our schooling system are overrepresented in bullying stats and exclusion stats. It pains me that in a country like New Zealand, we still have these significant gaps for disabled people. And I hope that this forum and many others will think about that important intersect between being a woman and being disabled. We all know that we don't just have one identity, we have multiple identities. And so when as a global group of wonderful women, we think about gender issues, it's so important that we recognize disabled women and the extra need to address the inequity gaps. Thank you for listening. I look forward to listening to other stories. Congratulations on bringing this together, Gertrude. Na mihi nui, kia koto, katoa. Thank you.